Okay, uh, it is our great pleasure to have Jan there today in this seminar series. And of course, Jan is very well known for his beautiful work with Michael Eisenman on the random field Ising model. But I, I hear that recently he's been working on many problems that are directly related to modern experiments. And I think today we're going to learn about something related to soft matter or active matter. Anyway, uh, Jan, please. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And since you mentioned the random field easing model, I can't resist a personal recollection that has to do with you. Uh, when I was a graduate student at Rutgers, Hall was a postdoc at Princeton, and uh, I was working on the random field easing model. He was interested in disordered systems, and we met a few times for a discussion. And during one of these meetings, Hall made a remark, casual remark, that uh, turned out to be absolutely crucial for my later dissertation work. So when I uh, wrote a paper with my advisor, Michael Eisenman, we uh, thanked Hal for his help and he expressed a surprise. So I wrote back to him, explaining to him, recalling the conversation that we had had. And his response was movement of wings of a butterfly in Japan can cause a hurricane on another continent. Very gracious, in style as Hal always was. And decades later, I want to reiterate that. Thanks Hal, without you, it would not have happened. Thank you. Today, I want to talk about something completely different uh, and there will be randomness, uh, but not static disorder as in the random field easing model. Uh, the randomness uh, will take a form uh, of time-dependent noise. And it will be about time evolution and about time evolution of real systems. Uh, the origin of this work is an experiment and what I'll talk about will be a combination of experiment that I have not conducted, of course. There was some numerics along the way, uh, some uh, less than fully rigorous applied mathematics, and a part that with a certain amount of generosity can be called mathematical physics. Uh, I'll uh, start for uh, defining the problem very broadly. Uh, if you have a system of uh, micro swimmers or swimmers in general, agents that are moving in some environment, perhaps in homogeneous, perhaps homogeneous, and they interact with each other by sending signals to one another, can you engineer a desired collective behavior in a group, an ensemble, a swarm perhaps of uh, such agents? And the desired behavior in question here uh, is aggregation or deaggregation. Can you induce them to uh, congregate or separate, what will achieve this? What can you do uh, changing the parameters of the system and preferably changing them remotely if this is a man-made system and you can pre-program the agents. Uh, that was an extended project, extended in time. There were several collaborators. Uh, maybe I'll come back to describe uh, their respective roles. Uh, later, I just wanted to indicate that uh, there were several people ranging from mathematicians, mathematical physicists, uh, to experimental physicists. The original idea, though, and that's worth mentioning, belonged to Giovanni Volpe, who's currently at the University of Gothenburg, uh, running a soft matter uh, lab, uh, and who initiated this work when he was at Bill Kent University um, in uh, Turkey. So in order to uh, understand how to approach this problem or how we approach this problem, uh, let me consider a single explorer in a landscape that's uh, inhomogeneous. And I want to endow this explorer with the following features. Uh, I want uh, its speed to be position dependent given by a function that will later be uh, denoted by V. And this is a planar region, so V will be a function of two variables, uh, X and Y. In order to explore the terrain better, the explorer is going to change direction of motion according to a random process. 
uh, and will react to uh, where it is, what its position is, by adjusting its speed. But that takes time. So between sensing the position and uh, the speed adjustment, there will be a certain uh, time lag, which I'll call sensorial delay. Sensorial delay is the main character of the stock. We are going to see that it's this parameter uh, that uh, changed, when changed, leads to uh, the desired behavior and sometimes dramatic changes in the behavior of uh, the single explorer I'm talking about right now or a group of uh, micro swimmers that we are going to switch to discuss uh, later. Uh, and then I'll introduce scaling because uh, I will want to have some explicit or close to explicit formulae and without taking a limit that simplifies the equations in addition to some other outrageous approximations I'm going to uh, make, uh, this would not be uh, available. Uh, the hope though uh, was when I was uh, working on it that in the limit uh, essential features of the system will be retained, and that indeed was confirmed by the experiment. So the initial equations of motion that I would like to write that include all uh, these features mentioned here uh, are the following. Uh, the time derivative of x variable is uh, the velocity, the speed uh, function v, uh, multiplied by the cosine or sine, depending which uh, component of the velocity I'm uh, talking about. Uh, C is uh, the parameter that describes the sensorial delay. And since I'm scaling the speed here by one over epsilon in order to uh, take uh, the limit uh, later, uh, the time delay uh, is also scaling with the parameter uh, epsilon and it's scaling uh, like the square of the epsilon with the coefficient c. It's that coefficient c that's all important here. The random direction changes are described by the Wiener process, Wt, which is also scaled, so these are rapid uh, direction changes. You can see the reason for scaling the speed. If you think about uh, what would the explorer really explore if it just kept changing the direction of motion you wouldn't get anywhere unless you make the speed also scaled with uh, epsilon. Uh, now these are uh, stochastic delay equations and as such are analytically intractable so I'm going to approximate them. The approximation consists of expanding, Taylor expanding the functions x, y, and then also the speed function v to first order. And then there is another approximation involved uh, at some point because what happens is one obtains a, a system of linear equations for the time derivatives of x and y, which one has to solve. That involves dividing by the determinant of the system and we approximate that determinant. Uh, and that leads to the uh, following system, which I hope is uh, visible here uh, in this makeshift arrangement, sorry, I'm traveling, uh, uh, which is now uh, a system of ETO equations uh, driven by a single noise source, WT. Uh, and after all these uh, expansions, uh, they uh, look as follows. Uh, randomness is only present in the last equation. It drives the whole system. I'm uh, stressing the fact uh, there, the, there is only one noise source because we are going to see that in the limit, uh, this uh, surprisingly changes. Uh, so uh, that's the system I want to study, and I want to study it in the limit uh, as uh, epsilon goes to zero. The idea being as follows. Phi is the variable that uh, defines the direction in which the... Oh, excuse me. It yeah. looks like Stefan has a question. So. Oh, sure, sure. Sorry. Yeah, just, just to get an intuitive feel. So the expanded equation, that looks like a total derivative a la hydrodynamics, this V dot grad V term. 
So, so is, is, is there one interpretation of this? This is effectively behaving like some sort of inertial effect, this time delay? Mm, I do not have a ready answer to that. I would have to think about this. This There may be a connection like this, which I did not explore. Yeah, no, but very interesting. I like the structure. Okay, well, thank you for the question, I'll, but I need to think about it. Thanks. Um, so the idea is to uh, take the limit and uh, eliminate the fast changing variable phi, uh, which describes the random direction changes, uh, and obtain effective equations for uh, x and y. This uh, procedure is very variously known as averaging, homogenization, idiabatic elimination of the fast variable, uh, and there are probably a few other names. Uh, the way one does this is by applying multi-scale analysis uh, and first passing from the general, uh, for, from the ETA system of equations to the associated diffusion equation, to the associated PDE. So I'm going to very briefly recall uh, on this page how one does this. And then the multi-scale analysis is performed on the diffusion equation, after which we go back to the SDE uh, picture, I'll uh, show you the diagram uh, that uh, describes this in just a moment. So here is a brief uh, uh, re recalling, recapitulation of the um, uh, Komogorov uh, method. In diffusion theory, if you have a general ecosystem with a drift vector field B uh, and several N noise sources labeled by alpha, uh, so that the equations of motion look like this, then you associate the partial differential equation with it, the diffusion equation time derivative of G equals LG, describing the evolution of uh, averages of observables uh, on the system. Uh, and uh, it's a second order uh, equation, uh, the coefficients uh, of which come from the coefficients of the ETA, uh, equations uh, in the usual way. This is the drift here and the matrix of the coefficients of the second order term uh, is uh, the matrix sigma describing the intensity of the noises multiplied by its transpose. That's what's written here in an expanded form. So the point of this is to say that uh, with a stochastic differential system, we associate a partial differential equation. If we then, in a certain sense, know how to take the limit of epsilon going to zero, which is this horizontal arrow here, and then know how to go back from the resulting limiting PDE to an SDE picture, then that's a roundabout but practical way of taking the limit of the SDE uh, itself. And uh, the way to uh, do this analytically uh, is by uh, conducting what's known singular, singular perturbation uh, theory. Uh, and uh, it works as follows. I'm only going to outline it. I do not want to bore you with the calculations. Uh, but the idea is the operator L, the infinitesimal generator of the diffusion associated with our stochastic differential system, in this case, because of the presence of the epsilon coefficient in the uh, equations, and it's present, it's all over the place, um, uh, the form of the infinitesimal generator is uh, as follows. Uh, there is a term proportional to epsilon in the power minus two. There's another. Uh, proportional to epsilon in the power minus one, and then there is a term of order one, uh, where these are explicit expressions for uh, these uh, differential operators. Uh, only one of them is of second order. Uh, and uh, what we do is we study the, the Komogorov equation. Technically, it's backward Komogorov equation. Uh, by postulating a formal expansion for its uh, solution in powers of uh, epsilon. Uh, and uh, as epsilon goes to zero, the only term in that formal expression that remains is G zero. 
And uh, that's what we want to find the limiting equation for, the limiting differential equation for. Once we found it, we are going to uh, follow that vertical arrow on the diagram and reconstruct the limiting uh, stochastic differential system uh, from it. Uh, and uh, the way we do this is by looking at uh, individual orders in the powers of epsilon in the equation to which we substitute the decomposition of L into different powers of epsilon and uh, decomposition of G indicated here. And we end up with the following three equations, which uh, we uh, solve easily because that's a relatively simple situation. Uh, solve explicitly as far as first two are concerned. And then the second equation, the third equation is handled in the following way. Uh, everything except the first term. So uh, I'll take the question just a moment. Let me finish the sentence. Um, uh, everything is brought over to the right hand side. And uh, therefore, the right hand side uh, is. Uh, in must belong, we realize, to the range of the operator L minus two. That's a simple orthogonality condition, which in this case is orthogonality to constants, which allows to write an explicit equation uh, for the uh, for G zero, which in order not to carry out the, uh, not to carry uh, along the index zero, I'm replacing by another letter uh, and write this as a PDE for the function row. Uh, question. Yeah, if I, I, if I could, I'm not absolutely familiar with that schema, but I, I think I've got an interesting question for myself here, which is, do you interpret this uh, equality in the first two equations as essentially on the time scale on which G0 evolves, G1 uh, is essentially stat quasi static? Is this a hierarchy of time scales notion? Uh, Yes, but it's not quasi-static. I think that uh, I mean I mean quasi-static in the sense of on the time scale in which G zero evolves, uh, the others have relaxed. I don't think so. Uh, offhand, I think that uh, they are actually uh, evolving faster. But well, that's what I mean by they, 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 they've relaxed down, so they're, they're evolving in a faster Oh, yes, okay, yes, 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 yes. sorry, Super. I misunderstood the question, yes. Yeah, very interesting, thanks. Yes, yes. Um, okay, uh, so uh, here is the limiting equation, which uh, I wrote in two forms, uh, in coordinates and also in a uh, uh, way without coordinates for two different reasons. Uh, the first uh, form uh, is what enables me to reconstruct the limiting equations, and here they are, and uh, I'm going to comment on them uh, much more extensively in just a moment because they are interesting, uh, and uh, I will want to explain where different terms in these uh, equations are coming from. Actually, it's not going to be in just a moment, but uh, it will be included in the talk a little later. So this is the corresponding SDE uh, system that I obtained. I also wrote it in an invariant way uh, because uh, in addition to the backward Kolmogorov equation, uh, there is also a forward equation, which is uh, known in physics uh, usually uh, as a Fokker-Planck, as the Fokker-Planck equation. And uh, uh, it has an important application here it is, uh, you obtain it by uh, taking the formal adjoint of the operator on the right hand uh, side, essentially integrating by parts. And it looks uh, like this right now. It's stationary solution, the function that makes the right hand side uh, zero, uh, is the density of the stationary distribution for the process described by DSD, if one exists. And in this case, remarkably, uh, the uh, solution can be obtained uh, explicitly. And uh, what it is, is when you do a little bit of calculus, uh, is it's a function which is proportional to the inverse power of V with the exponent equal to C plus two over two C, let me remind you, 
is this uh, coefficient uh, defining the uh, sensorial delay, which was put in the original uh, equations as a coefficient of epsilon squared in the uh, time delay uh, parameter here. It turns out here that it migrated to the exponent and uh, defines uh, the behavior of the stationary density of the system. B is a normalizing constant that normalizes th this density to one. So when one looks at this uh, uh, result, uh, it's rather intuitively clear uh, because what it says is that the uh, density of the stationary distribution is larger where the speed of the particle is smaller. This is very natural. It gets into a slower region. It remains there longer before it gets out of there. It's perhaps a little less clear uh, why the quantitative dependence on the speed is like this, but uh, so far, no big surprise. But uh, let me remind you that the interpretation of uh, the term C epsilon squared in these original equations was that this was a time delay. And naturally, uh, this goes with uh, the condition that C is uh, greater than or equal to zero. This is an actual time delay. However, what we did is we wrote the approximate equations in this form, which I'm repeating here. This is not a new uh, derivation. This is just for convenience. Uh, the uh, same equations that we uh, wrote earlier. Uh, these equations can be programmed or actually a robot, uh, a mechanical device or electronic device can be programmed to approximately follow these equations where of course you have to explain what it means to uh, change the direction according to a Wiener process. It's not going to be exactly a Wiener process but independent random variables coming from a random generator. You also have to explain how the robot calculates the uh, space derivatives of the function v. All of that can be approximately done. And in fact, uh, calculations of gradients are even performed uh, at some level by living organisms. Bacteria in chemotaxis do something similar uh, to that. Uh, but the point is that uh, uh, a man-made device can be approximate, can be programmed to approximately follow these equations. And at this point, the sign of the parameter C doesn't matter. One can program the robot to follow these equations with either sign of C positive or negative. Now, when you look back at the formula for the stationary density, you see that the tendency that we talked about uh, of the explorer spending more time where it moves slower will get reversed according to this formula at the value C equal to uh, negative two. And this is actually confirmed by the uh, experiment uh, when one uh, lets a robot follow these equations and vary, when one varies the parameter C, uh, the surprising tendency of spending more time where the motion is faster sets in uh, where C gets below negative two. What this means uh, is that one is considering now negative time delay. Negative time delay practically means, uh, or maybe not practically, figuratively speaking, means peeking into the future, trying to predict uh, what's going to happen. And as I said, even living organisms uh, do that, uh, bacteria do that, uh, robots certainly can do this at this uh, approximate. Uh, lab. Uh, a question, Ian? Sure. So if I look at the first equation that you wrote, then uh, C, I thought that she, C should be non-negative. Of course. So, okay. So then robot can never perform this, but in this case, you what, why is it possible? Because you did Taylor expansion or what? Yes. What? yes. Okay. Because uh -huh. I... After it, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, 
That's exactly right. But the, the point is, this is an approximation, of course, and a, and a serious one. Uh, but uh, you do have actual systems that follow these equations because you make them do this. Mm -hmm. And okay. if you think about the problem from the point of view of designing a system of particles that do what you want them to do, uh, this is uh, perhaps practically uh, important even if the original equations had been mutilated somewhat uh, and no longer recognizable. They were there for the motivation. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, uh, here's another a, question from yeah, Stephen. Just, yeah. just, just to follow yeah. up on that point. So if, if you thought of the velocity field as not something prescribed, but something that was determined by the collective motion, then maybe you could start to have this anticipation effect built in. But that's exactly the content of the page that I'm now on. You're 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 ahead. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm really very nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm impressed by this. So so this is an experiment that uh, Giovanni Volpe thought up and performed with his student Mitani Alco. Uh, now we have a group of robots, a system. There are several of them, and they have two features. Each one of them emits light, and each one of them is light sensitive, phototactic. Uh, and uh, what happens is that they now create the environment, in homogeneous environment, for each other in the following way. Each robot is measuring at every moment of time the total light field coming from the other robots, not its own. Uh, and uh, the speed is adjusted to the value of this total light field uh, by uh, decreasing function. So the more light, the slower the motion, the lower uh, the speed. Now, this is of course not uh, the situation described by our single particle equations because there the function V was time independent. And here everything is moving and at every moment of time, the landscape that the robot sees uh, is different. So uh, this is at best uh, a, a mean field way of looking at the motion of one of these robots, not even, uh, it's, it's uh, cruder than uh, mean field, nevertheless, it turns out that qualitatively, it's fully confirmed by uh, the experiment. So uh, the uh, above analysis for a single robot suggests that uh, when you write the analogous equations, when you make the uh, robots follow the analogous equations with the parameter C that's greater than minus two, the robots will tend to spend more time where they move slower. Moving slower means that uh, they will want to be, they spend more time where there is more light, but there is more light closer to the other robots and they will translate into a phenomenon of clustering, aggregation. On the other hand, uh, when you make the parameters C and you can do this actually remotely, uh, less than uh, minus two, then they will want to stay away from one another in order to move faster and moving faster requires less light, they move faster in the dark. And for that reason, they will try to separate as far as possible. And this is experimentally uh, confirmed. This is actually what's uh, happening in the experiments. Now, what's the status of these experiments? Original experiments were actually not performed with many robots. There were first three, then five, uh, then later, uh, I think right now, there are experiments that go up to about 100. All the while there was numerics that was fully confirming uh, the predictions of this uh, theory uh, and uh, seeing the aggregation and the aggregation depending on the parameter of C with a rather sharp transition at C equal minus two in the appropriate uh, units. I'll later give you a reference to a place online where you can see uh, some uh, of uh, these results. So 
this uh, wraps up one part of the story, which says what the motivation was, how one can engineer uh, this desired uh, behavior and how one can justify this or intuitively what leads intuitively to uh, that uh, prediction. In fact, the motivation was uh, uh, what we had in mind were possible uh, applications. Uh, there is an idea in uh, medical technology uh, and biomedical research to send swarms of micro robots through a patient's body, for example, to cure tumors of various kinds. Uh, and uh, you may want to uh, de-aggregate them to move by different paths in order not to create uh, a big channel in uh, the patient's body and then aggregate them uh, when you need them uh, in the same place. As far as I can understand, this is uh, present mostly at the level uh, of uh, a plan, a research program, and uh, I'm certainly not a biomedical engineer, but uh, as a motivation, this was actually uh, the main thing that uh, we had in mind. Uh, another possibility of applying these ideas is to macro robots that are sent on a search and rescue mission, where again, you may want to control their uh, aggregation properties. Uh, this is described in a little more detail in uh, the first paper we wrote on the subject. Here is the uh, reference. And if you follow that link, there will be a link on that page to the focus story. We were very proud and pleasantly surprised by American Physical Society selecting uh, this work as uh, their fo focus at a certain point. And this will also include the link to the first uh, movies uh, that show aggregation and deaggregation in the real uh, experiment uh, with the robots. Uh, I want to say a few words uh, about uh, the mathematics of uh, the SDE that we obtained uh, in uh, the limit. Uh, these are the equations. Again, I repeated them for uh, convenience. Uh, these are the equations that we obtained in the limit, homogenized equations, which no longer involve the direction or the, the angle uh, variable uh, phi. Uh, their striking feature is that uh, there are now two noise sources instead of one, two independent Wiener processes. How, does, how did this come about? Uh, well, uh, we had a limiting backward equation and this is how it looked. And in particular, it had the Laplacian term. And by the rules of the diffusion game, which we in fact formulated earlier, uh, there is a relation between the coefficients of the SDE and the coefficients of the Komogorov equation. And if you see a Laplacian here, there is no choice. There have to be uh, more than one uh, noise sources, in fact, as many as uh, is uh, the number of the uh, variables. So, uh, so this was dictated by essentially a recipe. But can we understand this? Is there any uh, more tangible way of saying what these two noise sources are? I want to stress there is no contradiction because by passing to the generator of the diffusion, uh, we uh, are working with weak convergence when taking the limit uh, as epsilon goes to zero convergence of stochastic processes in law. And uh, for this reason, we are not following individual solution paths of the original system as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, there is a number of results uh, that I was involved in uh, recently in which such stronger limits were taken for systems of uh, stochastic differential equations, uh, they mostly have to do with the so-called small mass uh, limit. Uh, this system is not amenable uh, to these methods. This is why we uh, had to uh, use the multi-scale uh, expansion. Uh, and uh, in particular, nothing of the sort could happen 
uh, in the uh, small mass limit, also known, known as Smolochowski Kramers approximation using the methods uh, that uh, uh, we used uh, earlier. So this remained a puzzle, though not a paradox uh, for quite a while uh, for me, uh, until uh, at some point I gave uh, a talk about an earlier version uh, of this work. Uh, and uh, uh, I got the following remark from Denis Bernard, uh, a physicist, who came across the following phenomenon uh, during his work uh, on quantum uh, optics. Uh, he obtained two independent uh, Wiener processes from one by uh, performing the following operation. I'll explain exactly what this means uh, in the context uh, of this equation. So, uh, so I have the puzzle here. I want to know why two independent linear processes. Uh, and uh, let me first dispose of uh, the easier part of explaining what, what these equations are. Uh, <clears throat> namely, I also have the terms C over two times V gradient uh, of V. These are easy to explain. If you look at the uh, equations before the limit was taken, they contain cosine squared of a fast oscillating uh, expression wt over epsilon. When epsilon goes to zero, this averages to the space, space average of cosine squared, which is one half. Same thing for sine squared and zero for the uh, mixed product of cosine uh, and sine. But uh, one other term in the original equations was uh, cosine and sine of wt over epsilon scaled by the factor one over epsilon. It's here that Denis' remark uh, became uh, relevant. Uh, the, mm, uh, this is mul multiplied in the equation by uh, the speed, v. But if you just look at this differential, it can be written. It's a vector with two coordinates. It can be written as the differential of one over epsilon times the integral of uh, a vector with coordinates cosine ws over epsilon and sine ws over epsilon. In the complex notation, this is uh, what I wrote here. Uh, and uh, then he made me aware that uh, uh, if you take the limit in law again, distribution, limit in distribution, of uh, this process, process uh, in the variable t, so we are not talking about a single random variable, but the whole process here, the limit actually is a two-dimensional linear process. These two components are independent in the limit. Uh, I uh, tried to look for this in literature and it does not appear uh, to be known in the probability literature, or maybe I did not look uh, far enough it turns out not to be too difficult to prove if you know that this is what you're trying to prove uh, already. Uh, with a little bit of stochastic calculus and a copy of uh, E.C. and Kurt's book on Markov processes, uh, you can uh, prove it. And this justifies the presence uh, of uh, these uh, surprising two different noise sources in uh, the limiting equations. If you think about it, uh, this is uh, a prescription of how to split one Wiener process into two independent ones. I certainly was not aware uh, of uh, this possibility, and I find it uh, aesthetically pleasing in addition to being surprising and perhaps useful. However, uh, in the original uh, equations, there's also another term that's as yet unexplained. Uh, we have argued that uh, C over two times VVX should be there because this is how cosine squared averages. Same thing for uh, the uh, term uh, in the second equation. Uh, 
we may be able to explain the presence of the two Wiener processors, although I'll, I'll uh, uh, have to say uh, a word about that too, because what I said so far is, is just a heuristic uh, argument. But first, let me comment on the presence of this term one times VVX, one times v, VY in the second equation that does not seem to come from anything in the original equations. It sort of appears in the limit. The way to think about this is the following. Once you agree that uh, these integral terms are approximations to the components of a two-dimensional Wiener process, uh, you may think about them as the Wiener process regularized somewhat. After all, they are not stochastic differentials. They are uh, regular. Uh, differentials. There is a well-known phenomenon in stochastic analysis uh, that says uh, if you drive an Ito system by a Wiener process and then regularize this Wiener process somewhat, and there are various incarnations of this theorem, but in particular convolution integrals with certain symmetry properties uh, will uh, work, then uh, the solutions of the resulting regularized ODE system with random coefficients, this is no longer an Ito equation, it's uh, an equation that can be solved pathwise. These solutions converge, but they converge to the solutions of the corresponding Stratonovich system. So the regularization changes the properties of the equation uh, in a way that's non-perturbative in the limit they converge, the solutions converge to solutions of a different equation and different means, including a correction drift term. Now, by analogy with this result, though certainly not following from it, you can think about uh, these two terms in uh, the uh, equation, the original equation that we are taking the limit of, as regularized versions of the Wiener terms coming from uh, this limiting two-dimensional Wiener process. And therefore, the Stratonovich correction is likely to appear. And the terms that I just asked about, VVX dt and VVY dt multiplied by the factor of one in each case are exactly the Stratonovich, the Stratonovich uh, correction coming from these two terms because Stratonovich correction calls for taking one half times the coefficient of the random of the noise times its derivative. And when you do that, uh, n times, yeah, one half, I said one half. And one half cancels the square of square root of two, uh, and you get exactly that uh, correction. As I said, this is uh, certainly not a proof of anything. This is just uh, an analogy with the classical theorem about uh, Stratonovich correction, that theorem belongs to Wong and Zakai and can be found in most textbooks on uh, stochastic analysis. Um, the actual proof uh, of convergence to these limiting equations, which are very strongly suggested by the singular perturbation theory, but singular perturbation theory is not rigorous mathematics because uh, you have to make certain educated choices uh, along the way. And in particular, you start from postulating a formal asymptotic expansion of the solution of the diffusion equation by of the Komogorov equation uh, in powers of epsilon, uh, which is not justified. Uh, so uh, if you want to have convergence to solutions uh, of this system of equations, you have to prove it you want to have a theorem to that effect. Uh, that uh, is, uh, in fact, a work in progress, though we are pretty confident uh, that uh, we're going to prove it, but it's not written up yet, uh, with Jeremy Burrell, who is uh, at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And what we use uh, is, as I said, not the Wong Zakai theorem, because it does not apply here. Uh, but the method of uh, random evolutions, uh, and again, the uh, uh, extremely useful, though rather rough to read book by Ethi and Kurtz is uh, what we uh, are using as uh, a source here. 
So uh, let me summarize briefly what uh, uh, I said. Uh, what we start from, and this is how it really did start, was an experiment with the uh, light sensitive uh, robots. In order to understand the behavior of the uh, movers, swimmers in this experiment, we conducted a multi scale analysis of one particle motion in an in homogeneous landscape. Uh, we realized the crucial role of uh, sensorial delay and, in fact, uh, the possibility of making it negative, peaking into the future, which is what realized this rap this uh, abrupt change in the behavior of uh, the uh, system. And along the way, we encountered an interesting SDE problem that uh, seems to involve uh, some uh, new uh, features that uh, we want to work out. Is there uh, any more left uh, to do? In fact, uh, there was more done, which uh, I do not want to go into because uh, uh, it involves more expressions and these are hard to follow uh, when you talk about them fast. But I just want to mention one thing. Uh, we consider the more complicated case in which uh, the random direction of changes uh, occur uh, with an intensity, intensity of the underlying inner process, which also depends on the particle's uh, position. So that means that the uh, term dWt over epsilon that was dictating these uh, random direction changes is now replaced by, uh, is now multiplied by a function of the position again with uh, a, a time delay and time delay is again proportional to epsilon squared this epsilon being the scaling factor but with another coefficient k and we can again carry out the uh, asymptotic analysis and obtain uh, limiting equations limiting equations are more complicated in this case and one uh, uh, distinct one one uh, different new feature that appears is that the limiting Markov process is no longer reversible. So you can uh, obtain a macroscopic current in uh, the system describing the motion of uh, a single explorer, and that translates into uh, a richer behavior in the swarm uh, that's uh, approximated. Uh, by uh, by that. That's written in, in, in the paper uh, uh, quoted uh, here. The problem that uh, we are also trying to address, uh, which uh, is at the moment uh, not solved, it's in progress, uh, and it's related to recent new experiments by Frank, the group of Frank Chichos uh, in Leipzig, uh, addresses the following question. Uh, does one have an interesting new features of the system when the direction changes become correlated in time? The hope is to uh, see something new. The first experimental results indicate that we may be obtaining something new, uh, but we don't understand it fully uh, yet. Uh, the, in very rough terms, what is happening is that by making the uh, process of random direction changes time correlated, we're introducing another time scale into the system, the time correlation scale, which now is going to interact in a non-trivial way with the delay that we uh, introduced. And by experience from some other systems, uh, electrical circuits uh, with time delay, random, uh, randomly uh, driven, uh, we know that interaction of different time scales uh, leads to very interesting uh, behavior. This is what we are hoping to see, and uh, this is what I'm trying to calculate uh, right now. Uh, and uh, I haven't arrived there yet, so uh, I cannot report any definite uh, results. I would like to go back to my first page and say a little bit about who did what. Uh, the 
Spiritus Movens of the whole project was Giovanni who came up with the idea, in particular with the idea of using the time delay in a creative uh, way. Uh, Meet uh, uh, was his very talented student. He's now in Stockholm working in the Karlinska Institute on Brain Imaging. Austin McDaniel was a graduate student uh, at the University of Arizona and he's now working on quantum optics uh, in an uh, uh, army uh, in New Mexico. Max and Freddy uh, are Swedish uh, students, former students of Giovanni working in Sweden and industry. And Jeremy Burrell is an exceptionally talented young mathematician at uh, Amherst with whom we are trying uh, to wrap up the complete proof of convergence uh, to the limiting uh, stochastic differential uh, uh, equations. And this is all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Hmm, this is very interesting. So any question or comments? I'm sure that Stefan has, yeah, please. Well, well Stefan, I, I guess I I, I guess I did have, uh, that was a, an applause actually, but thanks for inviting me in. So the, the work of Mike Cates on active matter, he, he's derived effective field theory systems. And I just wondered if you had bumped into that and whether you have get any sort of comparative remarks to make. What is the last name again? Eight Cates, Cambridge. The, the, uh, I, I'm not aware of this work, uh, but uh, I'd be very happy to take a look at that. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I mean, just in spirit, I mean, I, again, that's why I come back to that first remark about this uh, V dot grad V term. It's essentially deriving evolution equations which are not variational in nature, they are essentially driven or active. So they're hyperbolic or dispersive terms. That are derived and it's, it's an upscaling so it's a it's a stochastic model he starts with and then infers these uh, non-equilibrium models i think it could be interesting to compare with what you're doing okay sure thank you very much for this remark I, i'll certainly do that sure thanks any other question comments well Jan, I have a Jan, oh yes yes uh, please uh, is, is your model uh, reversible? I mean, the, 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 does it satisfy the detailed balance condition? Yes. So the first one, the, the one that I was talking about the whole time, yes, uh, in the limit. Yes, it is. Uh, and what I was trying to say on the last page is the moment you make the random time changes depend on the position, it no longer is except in some very special situations. So this was the remark. Yeah, so, so, about... yeah. so, so, so when it, when it is uh, reversible, then uh, it is easy to describe the stationary state. So what, what yes. is it? Oh, so that's that formula uh, with the inverse power of the speed function. Uh, oh. Yeah, not yet. That's yes, what it is. On. Yeah. yeah, so so the generator is self-adjoint with respect to this uh, the weight yes. given by yes. that. Yes. Yes, and that's, so, so, you know, yes, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so, so uh, the, uh, the, this is a two-dimensional system. So, uh, so it's uh, essentially the Laplacian um, I mean, uh, conjugated by this weight, or can one say that the, the generator is something like that? Or... Say, sorry, say it again. I was perplexed by what happened on my screen uh, because I no longer see what I'm showing you. Do, can you see, still see the page that I'm showing? Yes, yes, yes. yes. We see. Yes. I yeah, we see. Page so, yeah, so, so the, what, what was the question about the generator? So, so, so can one understand the generator as the Laplacian uh, conjugated by, by the, this weight or something, something of this sort? I mean, yes, the two-dimensional... 
pretty much, I believe so. Un unfortunately, I can't see the... Uh... Ah, yeah, okay, I, I see it. Uh, uh, so uh, when you look at the forward Kolmogorov equation, the way that this solution was obtained was essentially by taking off the divergence here and solving the resulting inner equation, so to speak, right? So there is no curl term, no uh, uh, macroscopic uh, current. Uh, that I think is another way of uh, saying what uh, what you're saying uh, about the conjugation by the Laplacian. I never wrote this explicitly this way, but this must be the same structure. Thank you. Okay, I, I have to look at this. I'm not. I, I cannot do calculations so quickly on my feet, but uh, I, I think that I know what you're asking about, and I have to sit down and read, and, and write it up. Okay, any other question, comments? Yes, so I, I'm curious if you have planned to go to many body, many robot case. Well, like starting you from mean, me field, yes. You mean rigorously? Uh, well, heuristic or rigorous or whatever. So, um, I'm thinking about this uh, and uh, at the moment, uh, there's certainly nothing to report. But yes, I would like not to stop at this one particle analysis, but try to take into account uh, more uh, seriously the interactions, not just at the heuristic level that says, mm -hmm. since one robot behaves like this, we expect the, um, several robots uh, behave like uh, in, in an according way, accordingly. Uh, what spoiled us here a little bit was the fact that we uh, obtained predictions that were uh, in such an agreement with the experiment. In fact, it was not right. honestly in parallel. So mm -hmm. I did not know what to expect. And the critical value of C equal minus two was calculated. I calculated it before I learned that uh, it was also coming out of the experiment. Nevertheless, this is only a qualitative uh, agreement mm -hmm. and it would be great to uh, try doing something uh, for the multi-particle system. I don't think it's hopeless mm -hmm. but uh, but it will require uh, certainly more than we did so far. Yeah so it is rather surprising that you know the, 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 you're studying this uh, single particle problem with a given landscape and on the other hand the experiment is done without landscape but many robots but still you're sort of getting ca capturing the essence of this robot experiments i i think is, the yeah. i i see uh, i see what you're saying and yeah but I, i'm saying that it's interesting but probably there must be some reason that this kind I, of the only description thing, the only works. reason i can think of is the following uh the uh, landscape changes because the robots are moving and the motion of robots is described by slow variables in the system. So from the point of view of the particle that's rapidly changing uh, its velocity, that landscape is of course not static, but it's not changing very rapidly. Hmm. That's, a, that's a rather tenuous argument, I realize that. And I'm not uh, going to put uh, a lot on it, but I think that's at this point, that's the only comment that I can make. Okay. <clears throat> Any other question, comments? Yes, I would like to have, I have one question, Marek Chippenbach. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Did you think about, because there, in, in uh, biology, there is, uh, there is this problem of flocks of birds and um, flock of fish. Do you think that uh, the similar approach can be uh, used to describe such phenomena? Uh, I think, I, I doubt that uh, these organisms uh, would uh, do something like the prediction that's involved uh, in uh, making the value of C uh, negative. It's not impossible because, as I said earlier, bacteria do something like this. But, but they have the similar of aggregation and disaggregation, and uh, sure. and they sure. do but, a signal but by optical uh, signal. Sure, that's that, that's correct. I don't know. It's not impossible. I didn't look into that in any detail. Uh, 
uh, we thought about it, of course, but we didn't address the series. Okay, thanks. Any other question, comments? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank well, Jan. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, th this was in dimension two. The, uh, is it interesting right. to ask uh, similar to, to consider this in other dimensions? Somehow? Yeah, thank you for this question. I, I actually should have mentioned this. We did the three dimensional uh, version uh, of uh, the um, one particle uh, movement, and uh, all was carried out in all detail. And everything is analogous, though the different of the parameter of the, the, the value of the critical parameter, sorry, the critical value of the parameter C comes out different. I think it's negative three in this, mm. uh, in the units that you uh, see here. And uh, uh, qualitatively, the behavior is the same. And uh, once when I presented this for general audience at the University of Arizona, we had a program called uh, Intellectual Cafe, I think, or something like this. Somebody said, uh, if you publicize your three-dimensional results, you're going to have Air Force on your back very quickly. <laughs> uh, it didn't happen so far, uh, but uh, uh, it may be useful for some uh, uh, three-dimensional man-made systems, uh, uh, and hopefully also benign and less belligerent. Okay. Any other question? Comments? Okay, so now we can thank Jan again. Thank you very much for the great talk.